I think we will get started. I think there are still people arriving, but there's nothing to stop us from beginning. So, um, hello everyone and welcome to virtually to the Department of English at Maynooth University Island. This is the fourth and final event in our research seminar series on the humanities and human rights hosted by the English department and run in conjunction with Crises, the scholarship hub supporting critical research into states, ecologies and societies. Uh, my name is Catherine Gander. I'm the uh, Associate Professor of American Literature here in the English department. And before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping items. I'd like to thank colleagues, first of all, in English, including Dr. Stephen O'Neill, Professor Lauren Arrington, Dr. Rita Sacker and Tracy O'Flaherty, who has been an invaluable help running the technological side of this series. Thank you to you, the attendees, for logging on to join us. And of course, a huge thank you to Dr. Zalfa Fegali for sharing her research with us this afternoon. I'd also like to thank our other speakers in the series, Dr. Nicole King, Professor Lindsay Stonebridge and Dr. Claire Gallion, who have made this seminar series in the humanities and human rights really exciting and successful. And their talks are available on our YouTube page. We're using a Zoom webinar, which means that attendees outside of the host department will be able to ask questions in the Q&A section of the talk by using the chat box. Members of the English department will be made panellists after the talk and can ask questions in person. This session will last between an hour and an hour and 15 minutes and it is being recorded. Thanks. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Zalfa Fagali virtually to Maynooth English. Dr. Fagali lectures in American literature at the University of Leicester in the UK, where she specialises in border studies, citizenship studies and indigenous studies as they play out in contemporary US and Canadian literature and culture and beyond. Before joining Leicester in 2016, she was senior lecturer in American literature at Canterbury Christchurch University and has also taught at the University of Birmingham, University of Nottingham, Nottingham Trent University and the American University of Beirut. She is currently Associate Editor of the Journal of American Studies, published by Cambridge University Press, and is the author of the monograph Crossing Borders and Queering Citizenship, Civic Reading Practice in Contemporary American and Canadian Literature, published by Manchester University Press in 2019, and the co-editor of the Routledge Companion to Gender and Borderlands, which is coming out in 2022. The work she is presenting today comes from her next book titled Alone Missing Murdered, Reading Violence and Vulnerability Across North American Borders. In this project, Dr. Fagali practices what she calls an ethics of reading for vulnerability, examining cultural responses from the United States, Canada and Mexico to the compounded cross-border crisis of vulnerability. There is an unprecedented emergency at the United States southern border. The crisis, however, is not only one of immigration or drugs or terror, as the Trump administration and others have argued, but, as Dr. Fagali argues, is a children's crisis, which has been deepening over the last decade and stretches back at least 20 years. This crisis has, until very recently, been largely ignored as a category of border studies and cultural analysis. And Dr. Fagali conceptualizes the United States-Mexico border as an unexamined archival repository of a crisis of vulnerability in the Americas. She does this by exploring contemporary cultural responses, what she calls children's crisis texts. Zalfa, you are very welcome. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, well done for getting through the title of my first book, which is quite the mouthful. Um, so thanks to everyone who's um, joined us today um, for spending another hour uh, in front of a screen. Thank you to Catherine for inviting me um, and for uh, all the other institutional things I should be thanking everyone for. Um, it's really nice, if a little bit scary, to do this, so I will kind of get started with the proviso, of course, that this material is a work in progress um, and has been hacked away from a chapter of my next book, um, as Catherine said, um, at 
focuses on vulnerability as a method of reading. Um, so please forgive any choppiness um, and also the fact that the end of the talk is basically a series of massive spoilers. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with this material and on this topic. I think it's fair to say that I will not be, uh, you know, resolving the crisis at the border. So I'm sorry if I'm disappointing you in advance, but I hope we can have a good q and um, assuming everyone sticks around and doesn't log off uh, in disgust. So I will see if I can share my screen and hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, right, so Time Magazine's May 2000 issue led with the news of six-year-old Elian Gonzalez. Um, I, was, I was a kid when, uh, when this came out and I remember watching it. And he'd been found on Thanksgiving day in 1999, having barely survived the perilous sea crossing from Cuba to Florida and his mother had not. Gonzalez arriving and in the United States as an unaccompanied child had since been living with relatives in Miami, but on the 22nd of April, 2000, so a few months later, uh, was seized at 5.15 a.m. by agents from the Immigration and Naturalization Service to be reunited with his father and returned to Cuba. National and international coverage of the controversial raid and the legal battles that followed um, lasted months and they were around his potential asylum application. It, they fed a public outcry over published images and videos of the child, you know, Ilian in the playground, Ilian at home. Um, Ilian's story kind of really enthralled the public. Um, and this was because uh, Sarah Banner Weiser puts it really well. Um, he was framed in ways that foregrounded his pro problematic potential as a political subject, what he represented metaphorically in terms of dominant ideologies about citizenship and immigration in the US. In the end, despite having fled Cuba with his mother, Gonzalez was ruled too young to comprehend a complicated asylum application. And since his father refused to file that application, there was no asylum claim to be heard. 18 years later, again on Thanksgiving Day, and I've just realized it's Thanksgiving Day today, um, US and international news outlets featured the image of Maria Lila Mesa and her children running from tear gas at the US-Mexico border. They had traveled from Honduras with a so-called migrant caravan, the subject of much political posturing um, and xenophobia from the joyfully one-term Trump administration in the second half of 2018. Mesa explained her motivation for traveling to the US-Mexico border with her children. She said, I came here for one reason, and that's because there's a lot of violence in Honduras. In a statement responding to the decision to use tear gas on people that day, the then Secretary of, De uh, of the Department of Homeland Security, um, Kirsten Nielsen, urged parents in the caravan to refrain from attempts to illegally enter our country because these acts will put your children in danger. Her warning to parents was likely intended to be perceived as one that appealed to the best interests of these children, even while the comment was all but a violent threat to their safety at the hands of the US authorities. So these episodes separated by nearly two decades and dealing with different border crossing and immigration circumstances are only two symptoms of a wider and long-standing US border crisis where the US nation state fails to protect the well-being of children at times actively engaging in child neglect and abuse. And today I focus on the US-Mexico border, perhaps the most prominent um, US border, the birthplace, as it's been put, of border study scholarship and a site that serves a range of real and imaginary myths. We all remember Trump's triggering of the National Emergencies Act and his February 2019 presidential proclamation, which claimed that the southern border is a major entry point for criminals gang members and illicit narcotics, which he says constitutes a national emergency. So uh, this is the premise from which I'm starting in a rare example of um, Donald Trump and I having uh, similar ideas. There is in fact, as Catherine outlined, an emergency at the US southern border, but it's not an immigration crime, drug or terror crisis. It's a children's crisis that has been deepening over the last decade and stretches back at least across the last 20 years. 
The crisis isn't new, but at the moment it is acute. Unaccompanied children are traveling to the US-Mexico border in record numbers. If their solo journey is successful, they're apprehended by customs and border patrol and begin another solo journey, this time navigating the labyrinth of the same contradictory US immigration system that in 2000 did not believe that as a child, Elian Gonzalez was capable of filing an asylum claim, but today believes that children as young as three years old can represent themselves in immigration court. Because unaccompanied children are an invisible and highly vulnerable population, their individual narratives are largely elided in uh, lots of mainstream framings and cultural representation, and especially in political policy making. So in this talk and in the longer project um, that this material is taken from, I want to try and address the elision. Children traveling to and arriving at the border find themselves at the interface of a number of critical discourses. They are in theory protected by international and local legal frameworks and agreements that are designed to protect their discrete but also overlapping rights as children, as refugees, as asylum seekers and as immigrants. So these do overlap. They live with the material and psychological consequences of domestic and international policies and intervention in their home countries and in the US. And these relate to warfare, health, citizenship, a range of areas. They're framed by politicians, policymakers, and the media in various ways. And less so, they're depicted in fiction, nonfiction, and film. So I want to try and work at this interface to conceptualize the US-Mexico border as the site of an archival repository of a catastrophic children's crisis in the Americas. So I'll share some of the work I've done in examining this body of work by exploring three contemporary cultural responses um, to this crisis, what I call children's crisis texts. And you can see them here, uh, US filmmakers, Rebecca Camisa's Which Way Home, and Mexican, uh, Amer Mexican authors, uh, Valeria Luiselli's nonfiction, Tell Me How It Ends from 2017, and a couple of years later, its auto-fictional counterpart, Lost Children Archive. These fiction and non-fiction cultural artifacts, only three in a pretty decent, I would say, body of children's crisis texts, demand to be read as archival material that, that preserves and imagines individual narratives, memories, and experiences of children who have journeyed to, approached, and crossed, or at least attempted to cross the US-Mexico border. These texts are not to be read uh, merely as cultural responses to or reflections of just what's going on. They're not just mirrors. They are historical artifacts that in their narrative engagement with what political economist James Brissett calls the politics of vulnerability, um, artifacts that must be restored and restoried to more fully understand and address the crisis. Because a social justice agenda is being set by the, by the archival field in a way that expands the reach of archival study, reading texts in this way allows us to shape public perceptions of what is valuable and important in our world. And in this case, the thing that's valuable and important other than stopping the crisis um, is the restoration of ignored, elided, hidden and lost voices and stories of these unaccompanied children. So I use this description, children's crisis texts, to bring together these contemporary texts because I see the categorization is working um, and I'm appropriating a genre theorist, Charles Bezerman here, as a frame for social action. In this case, the social action begins by uncovering and examining the archive, well, first noticing that it's there and reinterpreting and expanding archival concepts to disrupt dominant power structures and to promote justice. Children's crisis texts stand as a cultural watermark of this contemporary crisis. And I think really these texts are transformative. They make archivists of readers because in reading these texts, we are casts, we are cast as archivists keen to assemble, catalog and analyze, able to identify and work against the white supremacist, neoliberal, global governmental structures that have sought to relegate unaccompanied children to a state of abjection, undeserving of the rights and protections entitled to them as rights bearers in international law. The responsibility then of those I call reader archivists is, is pretty simple. Um, by taking 
an archival approach to these texts, we reconstitute this material. We preserve these narratives and we preserve, in a sense, the lost children whose stories can never been to be told. We therefore seek to fulfill the ethical obligation to witness that social action requires. And we hope to respond to Luiselli when she wonders in Lost Children Archive about what to tell our children, how to give them a story about a world in which children suffer at or near or on the way or even across American borders. Archives and archivists produce and reproduce both social justice and injustice in their shaping of the past, engagement with the present and building of futures. And while it has been held that the archivist plays a critical role in the construction of our knowledge of the past and its logical obverse in creating silences and gaps in memory, in the case of this particular archive, we can try to understand archival work as partially and importantly creatively addressing those gaps in history and knowledge and narratives by actively engaging with the contemporary, taking responsibility now. So I want to follow the journeys of children as they are depicted in children's crisis texts, as well as in oral accounts collated in reports from their lives at home to their decisions to travel to the US, to their journey and where it's available, um, the events that followed once they reached the border. So Rebecca Camisa's Which Way Home follows the stories of nine children as they travel from their homes in El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, and Guatemala in search of better lives. I read Tell Me How It Ends and Lost Children Archive as sibling co-texts that construct a self and mutually referential archive of the lives that, of the children that Louis Ellie meets during her time as a volunteer interpreter at immigration court in New York. And she juxtaposes these narratives with those of an auto-fictional narrator whose two young children run away to find lost children in the desert and are themselves then temporarily lost in the desert as well. So I'll concentrate on a couple of episodes common to um, Lewis Ellie's two texts, each concerned with recording and documenting the children's crisis using increasingly explicit archival narrative strategies. I explore how Lewis Ellie allows her children to play central roles in the narratives of the other children and not to humanize these unaccompanied, unknown children, but to show, as Lewis Ellie ultimately does, I think, that the lives of nameless children who are at the center of the real life crisis, that their lives matter. So each of the children's crisis texts I explore foregrounds the experiences of children at or on the way to the US-Mexico border, often with devastating consequences and always dangerous and traumatic. These texts expose the catastrophic depth, and I just keep saying catastrophe because I, I can't find other words, it's just like unprecedented, I guess, of this ongoing hemispheric children's crisis that crystallizes at this site, at the US-Mexico border. Camisa and Luiselli draw on these narrative archival techniques to assemble and catalog these lives and narratives. So the vast majority of children arriving at the US-Mexico border travel from the so-called, you can see it here, I hope, um, Northern Triangle, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, where we can cite human rights violations, the aftermath of civil wars, dangerously high crime rates, no rule of law, gang violence, femicide, lack of food security. But no one, Luiselli asks, is asking, why did they flee their homes? Really, why though? Very rarely is there an explicit engagement with what we might call the shared hemispheric history of the United States, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, and other countries as well in the Americas. But what happens with children's crisis texts is that they engage more explicitly with these underlying reasons. So in Tell Me How It Ends, Luiselli interviews a real life child, Manu, who's left Honduras to live with an aunt in the US because of the death threats he received at home from one gang trying to recruit him and another gang trying to kill him. Manu filed a police report in Honduras, which he has kept as proof that he informed the Honduran authorities that he had in fact been threatened and functions as what the author describes um, as a historical document, she says, that disclosed the failure of the document's original purpose, which is to protect him, and also explain the boy's decision to leave that life. 
Manu's report, an item or an entry in the Children's Crisis Archive, is evidence that children leave their homes because they live under threat. They seek out life. But the threat doesn't end when they decide to leave home. Which Way Home depicts Mexican founder of the House of Migrants, Miro Ramirez Garcia, giving advice to those traveling to the US-Mexico border. He says, Mexico is the passage of death for you. But the United States is not the passage of death. The United States is death itself, referring then not only to the journey, but life once across. It's a really awful foreshadowing. The journey north is treacherous for children whose unique vulnerabilities leave them exposed to violence, trafficking, and victimization. In Tell Me How It Ends, when interviewing children before their deportation hearings, Louis being, uh, recalls being told by almost everyone, she says, that they traveled through Mexico on La Bestia, the, um, the nickname for the network of freight trains that traverse Mexico. Riding La Bestia, as you might imagine, is extremely dangerous. Some children Louis Ellie speaks to compare La Bestia to a demon, she writes, others to a kind of vacuum that sucks distracted riders down its metal entrails. And while the train itself is not a threat, it's the smugglers, thieves, policemen, or soldiers who frequently threaten, blackmail, or attack the people on board. In which way home, Hiro, who I think is um, the, the child asleep with a cap on his face, um, Hiro explains that it's dangerous, he says, train life. I've heard the train called horse, but more than anything, they call it the beast, because you fall asleep and before you know it, you don't feel it, you just roll off. You fall and the train wheels grab hold of you. Depictions of the dangers of the journey, including La Bestia, are repeated in every single one of the children's crisis texts I've read. La Bestia connects these texts, not literally, obviously, um, but symbolically, as well as exposing this hemispheric, shared hemispheric responsibility for the children's welfare, many of whom do not survive the journey north. Which Way Home, and I won't actually show this, um, so we'll stay on this slide, um, but Which Way Home documents the known deaths of just two of the thousands of children whose attempts to reach the US-Mexico border are unsuccessful. The documentary makes it clear that there are two, there are only two narratives of many deaths and that there are in fact stories that can never be fully known or finished, as in the case of nine-year-olds Olga and Freddy who are traveling together from Honduras to be reunited with their parents who are already in the US. But as viewers are told in the final moments of the documentary, their whereabouts are unknown. As Lewis Ellie writes, numbers and maps tell horror stories, but the stories of deepest horror are perhaps those for which there are no numbers, no maps, no possible accountability, no words ever written or spoken. And perhaps the only way to grant any justice were that even possible is by hearing and recording those stories over and over again so that they can come back always to haunt and shame us. The us, so us, we, follow an ethical imperative to learn and remember and repeat stories that have no numbers and no maps. This imperative is difficult to act on because as Louis Sully puts it, these stories are always shuffled, stutters, stuttered, always shattered beyond the repair of narrative order. The problem with trying to tell their story is that it has no beginning or middle or end. But children's crisis texts are clearer in their instructions to us. In Tell Me How It Ends, Louis Ellie models this for readers when he sh she shares, for example, her research on the Salvadoran Civil War, mapping its direct connection to the formation of the LA-based gang um, MS-13, a gang that comes into being because of the US-backed Salvadoran Civil War, but is now used by the US government as evidence that there's an emergency on their southern border. Louis Ellie calls this an absurd circular nightmare, and I'm minded to agree. Catastrophic and nightmarish language also characterizes depictions and descriptions of children arriving at the border. The phenomenon has been described in terms that recall the language of a natural disaster or disease. Torrent, a wave, a surge, an influx of ep epidemic proportions. They had no idea about 2020 at this point, obviously. The existence of which allegedly poses a significant threat to the health and safety of the US public because of concerns that 
these children will overwhelm local schools and healthcare facilities and law enforcement and prompt financial ruin and spread disease and even help terrorists. Employing the language of health here suggests that the children's crisis is in fact a public health crisis. Um, you can get your irony klaxon out now, but of course only on the US side of the border because you know vulnerability and crisis uh, only materialize in America and in the United States. Uh, they don't pre-exist uh, the United States. I'm being facetious, of course. So the health implications for the children themselves are seldom the focus of any sustained attention, even while news stories proliferate and then evaporate about the horrific conditions and inhuman treatment um, of these children. Less reported are the fatalities that are the result um, of the journey. Um, and although some stories are partially and unethically rendered as such as those of um, Salvador and Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez and his young daughter, Angie, Angie, sorry, Angie Valeria, whose drowned bodies were briefly the focus of media attention when they were found at the banks of the Rio Grande in June 2019. So the children's journey to the US-Mexico border can therefore be fatal. Um, and there's a huge amount of really upsetting statistical analysis that I can offer you here that I think I'll um, not. Uh, but I think the message that I'm trying to send is when they say, when you have a statistic something that, that reads something like 15% of deaths at or near the US-Mexico border um, are recorded as people who are between zero and 19 years of age, and we think that's an undercount, um, this is something that needs to spur us to action rather than make us go, oh, well, that's, that's bad, and then change the channel. So, if they reach the US-Mexico border, most unaccompanied children intend to be apprehended by Customs and Border Patrol for their own safety and survival after the story. So this is the irony, they are trying to um, be caught. And in many cases, they can begin immigration proceedings to be reunited by family members already resident in the US. Once apprehended, children are placed in detention where they can only legal be, legally be kept for 72 hours before being moved to either longer term protective custody um, or being released to these relatives. And according to the US Department of Health and Human Services, unaccompanied child shelters provide um, housing, nutrition, physical and mental health care, educational services, and recreational activities. But this isn't true of so-called surge facilities and official records obtained by um, the American Civil Liberties Union made public and they're freely downloadable. Um, if you email me, I can send you the link. There are 30,000 records, each of which uh, more uh, devastating than the next. Um, these records show a pattern of intimidation, harassment, physical abuse, refusal of medical services and improper deportation. So despite the fact that any treatment of unaccompanied uh, minors should follow a number of international conventions and protocols, what we actually see that is that the US-Mexico border forms an exemplary space of exception where those seeking to enter the country without permission are often reduced to bare life. This reduction of children to bare life, putting, putting primacy on the fact of their being merely kept alive rather than um, considerations to their quality of life is evidenced time and time again in these documents. Um, and I should say there's a content warning uh, for sexual assault in this particular one. Um, so it's evidenced time and time again in these documents. You see, for example, a 16 year old child describing the food, including moldy bread, which made her ill when she requested medication, it was denied. And so this reduction of children to bare life and the denial of what Hannah Arendt would call the right to have rights is also, also a strategy of at least the current Trump administration, stretching back to, if we're honest, um, which has attempted, certainly the Trump administration, administration has attempted to prove that it is not in breach of the Flores Agreement from a slide ago, arguing that Flores did not include specific st stipulations for what constituted safe and sanitary conditions for children to be detained. And there was um, a, a long conversation in court about whether toothpaste should count in safe and sanitary. Should these children get toothpaste or not? Uh, the lawyers uh, that were for the government said no. So you'll all remember in June 2018, it was alleged 
um, that children were being kept in cages at detention facilities, sparking outrage within the US and beyond, semantic debates around the word cage. Um, a year later, in June 2019, the Department of Health and Human Services announced that more unaccompanied uh, children would be detained at Oklahoma military base Fort Sill, the site of an internment camp during World War II, prompting comparisons between these sites and concentration camps, and also further semantic debates around the definition of concentration camp. Uh, a year or so after that, which is this year, um, just a, a couple of months ago, we learned that about um, just under 9,000, so 8,800 unaccompanied children who had been detained in hotels were expelled from the US along the Mexico border under a pandemic related measure that effectively ended asylum. This is called Title 42, and it's been invoked um, to basically turn back anyone who tries to cross the US border uh, based on the fact that they will bring in COVID-19. So understandably then, children's crisis texts uh, consistently depict traumatized children, either because of their journey um, or because of their detention. Kevin is the only child shown in Which Way Home to actually cross the US-Mexico US border, and he recalls being in a boxcar on La Bestia and witnessing the sexual assault of two women. Clearly distressed, he reflects on the specific suffering of women as they took the same journey that he was on. He said it was un extremely unpleasant uh, to come on this journey and see how the women suffer. Because of the trauma they experience, and you see this when you watch the documentary, and I hope you will do, the children's stories often become uh, generalized, distorted, um, and appear out of focus. The role of the reader, then, of us, is to not only piece together the elements of these stories, but to catalog them within this crisis drawing on archival cotex that I've just kind of gone through and factual information and actual facts um, to restore these ignored and silenced narratives. So we see Luiselli modeling this practice in Lost Children Archive when she has her principal narrator by her son, nicknamed in the novel Swift Feather, a Polaroid camera, which he learns to use over the course of their road trip across the US Southwest. He tries to understand the purpose of using a camera for documentation, what am I supposed to do? And his mother explains to him that he just needs to think of photographing as if he were recording the sound of an echo, and we can talk about echoes um, in the Q&A if you'd like. After a few unsuccessful attempts at taking photographs, the mother and son conclude that the camera may be broken. And the mother reads through the instruction manual before taking the first successful photo of her children playing. I pick up the camera, look around the field through the lens. I finally find the children Focus, refocus, shoot. Luiselli provides a clear instruction for us. Read the instructions. Um, these children have to be seen and recorded using a functional device, using a clear uh, device and approach and with a purpose. Reader archivists must find the children, assemble their stories and catalog and know them. Focus, refocus and shoot. She reframes the military command and gives the instruction a productive rather than a murderous purpose. We also see her use the narrator's daughter nicknamed Memphis to critique existing methods of dealing with the children's crisis. So the daughter has been taught at school to tell stories using four squares, like, just like the ones you can see on the screen, character setting, problem and solution. And her mother critiques this method. She says bad literary education begins too early and continues for way too long. What she's suggesting here is what we all know, that the children and their stories, these unaccompanied children, um, their stories work in excess of conventional narrative strategies. Because as she says, telling stories doesn't say, solve anything, doesn't reassemble broken lives, what the author does is devise new methods for us to catalogue and understand the stories of these unaccompanied lost children. And indeed, Tell Me How It Ends takes its title from the question Luiselli's young daughter repeatedly asks when her mother shares the children of the children she has, the stories of the children she has met at immigration court. But how does these, how does the story about those girls end, my daughter asks. I don't know how it ends, I say. She comes back to this question often, demanding a proper conclusion with the insistence of very small children. But what happens next, Mama? 
Nuiselli here foregrounds the voice and questions of a young child as a prompt for us. The story of the girls that Luiselli refers to is that of two young Guatemalan children, aged five and seven, whose mother, this is the real life version, um, whose mother is living in Long Island um, and has sent for them from Guatemala. The day before they left, this is um, Luiselli, their grandmother sewed a 10 digit telephone number on the colors of the dress each girl would wear throughout the entire trip. Once the girls reached the US-Mexico border, they were to show the phone number to border patrol and the rest would follow. In Tell Me How It Ends, Luiselli ends the girls' story after she's interviewed them in the hope that their responses would align with what the law considers reason enough for the right to protection. But we don't actually, in that version, in Tell Me How It Ends, we don't get closure about the story and what happens to those girls. Um, we get it instead in Lost Children Archive. So in the novel's version of the story, the two girls with telephone numbers sewn into their dresses are a bit older, eight and 10. Um, they're from Mexico, not Guatemala, and are in a detention center in Texas. This difference, it seems minor, but it matters because according to US immigration law, children arriving from countries that are contiguous to the US, so Mexico or Canada, um, maybe after being screened to ensure that they're not being trafficked or fear of persecution in their home country, and we can talk about what the screening process entails, um, they are to be returned immediately. This process means that they are automatically considered to be deportable. In Lost Children Archive, the two girls are deportable, but the Border Patrol officer somehow takes pity on them. Um, he speaks to their mother, uh, and has managed to keep them in detention so the mother can seek legal representation for her daughters. Later in the novel, uh, Manuela tells our narrator, so that's these girls' mother, tells the narrator of Lost Children Archive that the girls' asylum petition has been unsuccessful and they were going to be transferred to another detention center and then deported back to Mexico. But they disappear on the day that they were going to be transferred. They never appear um, in Mexico City. Uh, and, the, and their mother is convinced that effectively they've escaped and they're trying to make their way to her. In Tell Me How It Ends, Luiselli asks, were they to find themselves alone crossing borders and countries, would my own children survive? She tests this hypothesis in Lost Children Archive, asking their pretty much exactly the same question as you can see here, were they to find themselves alone, would our own children survive? The narrator's two young children do eventually find themselves alone, having run away from their parents in search of Manuela's two young daughters, in the hope, the son believes, of saving his parents' marriage. It's a long story. Please read the novel. Swift Feather looks through his mother's archive box and sees a map and two X's marked with a pen. Maybe the two X's, he thinks, were the two girls Mama often spoke about, Manuela's daughters who had gone missing. He draws his own map, so that he and Memphis can get to the two X's and then travel to Echo Canyon, where they've already been as part of their road trip. They end up getting separated, but they work out that um, they both follow the plan anyway, and they meet up again, the, these siblings, atop a freight train, not La Bestia, but its narrative analog, hoping that it's going to get them closer to the two X's. Once Swift Feather and Memphis have reunited, they get off the train. He says, you gave me your hand and I held it tight. We walked into the unreal desert like the lost children's desert and under their blazing sun. The two children end up spending the night in an abandoned train car with a real or imagined, or it doesn't matter, group of unaccompanied children who've traveled to the US. The next day they get to Echo Canyon where they are found with their parents who eventually do decide to separate. Um, and the boy who's traveling, who's leaving with his dad leaves his sister one last note because he says, this is where the story end, ends, in which we discover, of course, that the bodies of Manuela's daughters have been found in the desert. So Luiselli ties her narrator's children and her narrator's family culture or subculture to the fate of the two girls in a way that suggests that the lack of a social, any social and political action to protect children at or near or approaching or over US borders is a threat that follows and should haunt and shame all readers. These texts are appeals to readers and viewers to take actions. Readers and archivists should not only record, but act. Because documenting, 
as Swift Feather reminds his mother, just means to collect the, posterity, the present for posterity. But our work, the work of these reader archivists, involves the reinscription and inclusion of children into the way that we produce knowledge, into our broader narratives of the border, into academic histories and into transnational cross-border memories from where they've been betrayed and lost and forgotten or ignored. And in this way, as South African archivist Bern Harris reminds us, the archive can be an instrument for subversion and it's a subversion that must take place to protect children today, an instrument that must be wielded by readers so that the lost children's stories can be recreated, restored and restoried. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that just wonderful talk. Um, I have an awful lot of questions uh, <laughs> and comments. Okay, and, and yes, and I, I think I could talk about this all night with you. I am going to ask now for um, any questions that people have in the uh, audience, if you would like to write your questions in the chat box and um, our own uh, staff members and, and um, members of the uh, English department at Maynooth will be made uh, panelists and they will be able to ask you a question in person, Zalfa. Great. I think, yes. Um, I think maybe uh, I've got a, I'm gonna pull out some of the words that you actually used in your talk here. So one of the things that really struck me from about halfway through that was when you were speaking about that young boy with the document that he had for the pol police, kind of report yeah. um, and you phrased it in, in, in such a lovely way, something like um, a document that explains its own failure. Mm. Um, and, you know, this also got me thinking to, you know, the very notion of the archive. And if we go back to that, you know, uh, grounding text, I guess, of, of, of archive fever, you know, what Derrida says about the archive being, um, this uh, a kind of double doubleness in itself in that it shelters in itself uh, its memory of its etymology as a kind of commencement or origin um, and but then it also shelters in itself uh, or rather shelters itself from this memory in other words it exi exists to forget itself um, so that you know the archive is always uh, one of the you know this kind of repository of repository of Oops, I'm, I'm echoing a little, um, of, um, you know, gathering things for, for memory, uh, for posterity or whatever, to create a cultural narrative and at the same time, of course, existing to forget it. So um, I guess I'd, my first question is, could you talk a little bit more about how you envisage the border as, as archive? Yeah. Do you want to send me your, say your second question so I can try and... Uh, okay, well, oh, yeah. the, the second question is to do with that, but it's 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 also to do with, um, I guess, that you know, how texts respond to that. So the actual kind of um, uh, formal elements of the text themselves. Um, but I, th I think I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, um, that question, which is about kind of stories working in excess of excess of the conventional narrative strategies that we have for them. But let's let's start with the archive one first. Yeah, um, no, I think the border as an archive, it, it, it's really interesting because, well, that's a very bland thing to say. Of course, it's interesting. Uh, the border is an archive of a lot of things. The border is an archive of, um, so thinking about the way borders are conceived of, um, we can go back to this kind of really originary description of the border as an open wound when, when Gloria Anzaldúa says it's an open wound with a third world grates against the first and bleeds. Um, so it's an archive of that, but it's an archive of violence. It's, it's a history of consistent violence from its very, um, from its very beginning, just to pick up on what you're saying. So it gets created in a settler colonial moment and as a result of settler colonialism that has been forgotten. We have forgotten about it because we live it and we think it's the way that things go and everyone who's complaining about it needs to just sort of get over it. But settler colonialism structures the very way in which we understand the world and understand each other. Um, and I suppose under 
the way in which white supremacy is, but I'm going to use the words, I think white supremacy is the structuring principle of the way we see us versus them and the way we conceive of the other in the first place. So the border is an archive of all that. The border is an archive of violence against indigenous people. Um, one of the things that I forgot to say, even though I think I mentioned to you that I needed to write myself a note to, to make sure that I say it, is that um, the va most, I'm not gonna say the vast majority because we don't have breakdowns. And again, that's another gap in knowledge. Um, a huge amount of the children approaching the border are indigenous um, from various indigenous nations in South America. Uh, so they don't speak the language. They come up to this border, which is a historical place and historic place of violence, and nobody speaks their language and they're being funneled through these systems completely blind. So it is the archive of what they can't say as much as the archive of what they can say. Um, I'm just starting to ramble now, um, but I'm going to keep thinking about that because it is, I know, a discussion that we want to keep having. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of your second question, I think, I think texts, I think what they're doing, and uh, the best way of putting it, really, the best example to use is Lost Children Archive, because it's so self-referential, it's so elusive, it's so thick and textured, and it's a hybrid text, and it's, in a way, um, kind of following the, I don't like to say trend, but the kind of development or the movement towards hybrid modes of writing that elicit new ways to, to, ha to do effective reading, affective reading, right? So yeah, I mean, I'm going to think about that one as well, but yeah. You know, I, I and I think you know. I'm, okay, I'm biased here, but I think you know, poetry's kind of been ahead of it. <laughs> oh. uh, documentary poetry, is okay. it, right? Um, but the sort of amazing hybrid texts um, in, in in poetry are, are dealing with exactly the things yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah. You know, decolonizing the archive, opening it up to counter narratives, etc. Yeah. So I'm going to move to the um, chat and kind of connect some of these points that we've just been Thank speaking you. about to that. So Emily Hartman has um, asked you a question about the motif of echoes and how that relates to the ethics of representation and um, just to kind of add to what Emily's saying there I think I wonder if you could speak also about how echoes relate to those points that you've just mentioned in terms of where have you gone uh, oh, like, uh, uh, colonialism uh, the hit like the ongoing history of colonialism basically um, and maybe kind of also connecting to what Avery Gordon talks about uh, in Ghostly Matters as a, a kind of haunting of the past in order to get something done, right? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so what, what do you think to, of, of Emily's question there about the motif of echoes? Um, I think, sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I just need to try and remember these questions because they, they're really good. Um, and I know my mind will go completely blank. Thank you for, for that question. So I think that my, um, that my reading of the echoes or one of the readings of the echoes that I think it could be is useful for what I'm trying to do um, with this book uh, is to think about, as you said, Catherine, kind of uh, the haunting, um, the constant return, right? And I don't want to get um, Nietzschean, so I won't, but uh, I've dropped the name in anyway. And I, I think the way that, I, that, again, it comes back to the settler colonial, um, structure of this place, but also this, but also settler colonialism more broadly. The idea, um, and I'm th thinking about here, Eve Tuck and Sivri, um, who, what is, what is it called? A glossary of haunting, I think. Um, it's from a few years ago. If you go to Eve Tuck's, um, and she's an indigenous scholar, she's amazing, um, website, it's all available uh, on the website. PDFs for free, so please do it. But she says that haunting is something that needs to, you can't resolve haunting. So in the same way that we can't resolve what's going on at the border, it, it needs to come back and continue to come back and continue to come back for it to be defined as a haunting. Um, she says it's, I, she describes it, I think, as relentless. 
relentless remembering. And it, it really uh, chimes with what Luiselli says when she says we have to, uh, you know, we have to have these numbers and maps or we have to have these stories come back and haunt and shame us forever. It's not like if we, um, if we figure it all out and somehow come up with an archive and they even build a building around it and do that great. Uh, it's not over. The idea of it is that it still has to haunt us. And if it doesn't haunt us, then it's been institutionalized and something else is going on. But th that is for Tuck and Re, it's because of settler colonial relations. It's because of that deep um, injustice and the way and a way out of it or around it, I suppose, is to think through real, not figurative, I'm choosing my words really carefully here, decolonizations. So for indigenous people, that means a really specific thing. It doesn't mean decolonize your curriculum. Um, it means give me back my land, please, that you stole from us. So yeah, I think the haunt, the, the echoes are there to remind us that I guess the US is built on this history of violence, history of genocide, history of slavery that Lewis Ellie touches on, but then moves away from, but then comes back to um, in the novel. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there I'll, I'm, because before I get totally incoherent. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I, and I hope, Emily, that that um, answered your question. Thank we you, Emily. We have a lot of questions to move through um, and we'll try and answer as many as possible. So, um, Andrea, I don't know if Andrea is still here, actually, because her name is um, greyed out. But anyway, the question was, what agencies and organisations are working with the children inside the centres? So, uh, so Dalfa, are you aware of any NGOs able to make the situation more livable and actually provide proper aid and education to the children? So a quick one there from Andrea about this situation inside the centers? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Andrea. Some of them are um, privatized, and so I don't have a lot of information about them. Some of them are, and others are run by the Office of Refugee Resettlement that's part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, effectively, what we see, or so, some places are better than others, but really when, when the young people, I was going to say students, when the children are in detention, um, the conditions are terrible. Uh, so you you have them, uh, no, nobody wants to hear this at five o'clock on a Thursday night, but you'll, you'll have young people in, in of, of the room the size of a gym, say, um, with one toilet and one mattress. And the guards will um, nominate, you know, this child here to be the boss. And they, they create a gang structure for these children. Um, in the actual, in kind of longer term custody, uh, things are a little bit better. There is a structure of kind of schooling and going outside to, to the playground and so on, but it's, it's a, uh, there's a black hole in the data because they don't know where and how, everyone reports it differently. So even earlier when I went to update these slides um, to account for the numbers just for this year. They've completely erased and deleted any data before 2013. You just can't find it. And so I have it because I printed it out. And I'm sure it's kind of somewhere, but the, the data and the records are, well, I think we can give them the benefit of the doubt potentially and say the data and the records are hidden in a labyrinth. And I don't know, I don't have any breadcrumbs at this point. But that is a really good question, Andrea, Thanks. if you're still here. Um, we have lots more questions in the chat, but also a question from Rita, my colleague in the English department. Rita? Hi, Zalfa. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question on representation also, um, Zalfa, and it's really about 
what you've mapped so beautifully in this powerful talk um, from map to metaphor to narrative, or I don't know how, what kind of triangulation of these that works so well, so cleverly in Lost Children Archive. And um, that quote from, um, tell me who, um, how it ends, the stories of deepest horror are perhaps those of which there are no numbers, no yeah. maps, and how it relates to another quote from the Lost Children Archive, one of the lines that moved me um, to think about narrative technique, when the boy tells his mother that um, the children disappeared from the map, which is like a metaphor, but also not because it's real, they got disappeared. So my question really is about uh, thinking of this, uh, how Luiselli deals with metaphor against misrepresentation, like the uh, reference to the kids as alien kids, mm -hmm. and how uh, when she speaks with her um, girl about bad literary education, how that all builds up into this question of ethics of representation for somebody who uses autofiction or nonfiction. So the choice of genre, the choice of narrative technique, um, and a sub-question, um, what is really the narrative technique here? Is it nightmare realist, horrific surrealist? I am uh, stealing all those words from asylum-seeking narratives, uh, contemporary ones, but some of the more salient ones. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I mean, what a great question, and also what a great sub-question. Um, I have always read I mean, that specific scene that you mentioned, but also what it, how we can extrapolate it. I've always read it as um, the way that knowledge, the way that knowledge production is really scary. Uh, scary in the sense that it's no like we don't actually, it's entirely polarized. We don't actually know what we know. Or there are some people who genuinely don't think that I know what I know, and that can be a fact. Um, and what I mean by that is you know, the alternative facts era in, in which we live. So the idea that the boy gives us, I think what the boy does, and what the bad literary education um, example does is, give us an example of what not to do. Um, what not to do in the sense of, of spinning data, of bending it, of, of, of and you know, the, the ethics around bending data when it has to do with children. Uh, of, of course, when it has to do with any sort of human being, but in my case, especially children, because of the of the deep insidiousness of, of what that really means, you know, and, you know, children, of course, you know, in the really literal sense that they are the future, and if the future is just kind of completely abandoned, then, then what do we have left? Because we can't take our money with us. So, yeah, I, I, I really like that, this idea of the metaphor against misrepresentation. I will, um, I will keep thinking about it. And I don't know if I know the answer to your sub question. I, I'm going to have to keep thinking about that. But do you have uh, a kind of view on it? Not at all. I, I, I literally wrote nightmare realist and horrific surrealist across the pages. Right. And I wouldn't know if that if you don't know. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I I um, I'm with you there. I, maybe maybe we should have a different conversation and and work through it together. <laughs> That sounds great. Okay, thank you so much for that answer and that question. Um, there are sort of two questions that are interrelated, so I'm going to put them back uh, together, if you don't mind, Chris okay. and Gillian. Hi, Gillian. Um, so Chris says, hey, Zalfa, sorry for the long question. In light of your previous work on queer studies, how does the figure of the child function in this new project, i.e. the crude binary between Edelman's child of reproductive futurism and Stockton's queer child that breaks open the heteronormative? Sorry if this is not immediately relevant to the work you're doing. Uh, keep that in mind. And Gillian says, hello as well. Thanks so much for this great talk. I wonder if you could say more, Zalfa, about the figure of the child and the way in which it is deployed in news coverage of the crisis 
and in the texts that you're looking at. So you can see that those, those two questions kind of talk to yeah. each other. Um, I'm actually uh, pleasantly surprised that, that, um, that Jillian didn't ask another question, which I was prepared for. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, you, you've surprised me as usual, Gillian. Um, right, two really good questions. I have done very little thinking about this idea of the figure of the child, um, in part because uh, I find it personally really distressing to um, read all of this stuff when you, you read these kind of reports where children have gone to a figure of authority and say, you know, they did this to me, they did that to me, um, and they just write them down in black and white. Um, but the way that children are mobilized in a range of ways, and we don't have to, we should, but um, we don't necessarily need to stick to the US next to a border for and, and treatments of borders and treatments of children in the US um, to think about this. They're mobilized in the most deeply unethical, and I don't know what the ethical way to, to, to depict or to use a figure, the figure of a child is, but I suspect you just don't. Um, that's that's my view. Uh, I think the way children are used are is what kind of Chris would uh, has described. Um, is this your question, Chris? Yes, the crude binary between um, the child of reproductive futurism uh, and the queer child. So, so yeah. I mean, do I have to think about Stockton? I might not. Um, only, I mean, today, right now, because I feel unequipped, ill-equipped. But yes, mm -hmm. I will do some thinking. Chris, um, we can keep talking, um, and so can we, Gillian. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Okay, there is a question. I'm just going to connect to Steph's question about hybrid text, and then I haven't forgotten you, Emma Andrew. I'm going to come back to you in a second. So just because this one um, segues a little more easily, talking of hybrid text, and we're talking about hybrid text and narrative genres, and uh, thinking about you know about Rita's question there and my kind of opening calf question at the beginning. Um, to what extent does the Latin American tradition of testimonio inform this work? and especially its relationship with the disappeared in a broader context of the Americas. Hmm? Yeah, I We're mean... speaking of the work of Marta Caminero Sant'Angelo on undocumented narratives. More a comment than a question, I think. Well, both. Um, what do you so there? We, should, we, we should say that Steph was one of my PhD supervisors, so um, she is being typically generous um, in the way that she's framed the question uh, to kind of half give me the answer. But yes, absolutely. And it's worth saying, actually, that this is the first uh, novel that uh, Louis Sully has written in English. So the rest of her work is translated. Um, and I think the fact that she's chosen to write it in English is important because she's moving. She's she. It, it's a further kind of, um, what is the right word? It's a further traveling, I guess, of the form of the testimonio into, uh, into English, a Mexican woman living in New York, writing in English when she usually writes in Spanish and then um, works with translators. So if you've ever read any um, of Louis Sully's other work, um, it's in translation, it's absolutely brilliant, but it's, it's in translation. Um, and so transplanting that genre matters because it's her, transplantation rather than an appropriation. And it starts, I think, in an important way to um, continue the work of a lot of uh, writers from South America, Mexico and South America, which is to kind of really break apart our understanding of what US literature means and what it's supposed to do. And um, I'm thinking of, I just recorded a lecture on what is ethnic American literature. And um, so I think I'm probably channeling that. But but yeah, I mean, absolutely, Steph, as usual, you're right. Thank you, Steph. 
Um, okay, and now to return to that question from Emma Andre, um, I'd like to know your reflection on the fact that the US government and ICE declared multiple times to have lost thousands of children in the immigration camps. Is it plausible to assume these kids have been victims to human trafficking? I don't know. Um, they, so there are a number of reasons that they, they I mean, they, they've certainly they are certainly not with their parents, right? They were separated and it's important to make the distinction um, around unaccompanied children and separated children. So the family separation policy is actually something that comes in. Um, it, it, it predates Donald Trump's administration. Um, but yeah, so the children who aren't with their parents at the moment, who are, I think they've been described in, in, uh, by, in government documents as just misplaced, which is, uh, uh, there are a number of reasons other than I think just total incompetence um, that, that this has happened. Um, in part, what I was saying earlier around, around language, around uh, the ability for people to be able to um, get the right translators who speak the right languages. So in, in some of the Southwest um, border detain, uh, detention facilities, you have translators for, I think, um, I think it's less than a dozen indigenous languages, um, as in from, uh, of indigenous nations in South America, but there are like over 500 languages. So your dozen doesn't really help. And so that's one of the reasons that there has just been a lack of care about these children and the other is, of course, some of them are incredibly young, so it, it's not really their responsibility to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm zero years old, but here's my address and this is the name of my parents. Um, so it's, again, the problem that we bump into when we try to understand how many children are coming to the border, how many children have not made it to the border, how many children ha have just disappeared, there is a systemic lack of record keeping. And this systemic lack of record keeping is um, importantly kind of legally gray, uh, but most relevant, I think it, it costs lives. Uh, we're not, we haven't been talking about the misplaced children. They, come, they kind of come in, you know, I think I, I was quite proud of the phrasing um, they proliferate and then they evaporate. These news stories of, of um, children at the border or on this topic. And we just don't care enough. But yeah, I don't know if they've been trafficked, Emma. I really hope they haven't, obviously. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, Emma. We are um, <laughs> rapidly running out of time. This has yeah. absolutely flown by. Um, I think that, I mean, you just, uh, two more things I'd like to say, but perhaps before we, we wrap up and one of them you just gestured to, which is that, you know, this was obviously, you know, we, we associate these horrors, children in cages, etc., with the Trump administration, but of course this has existed way before the Trump administration did. And then thinking of that kind of famous image of the, of the detention center bus with all those little kids seats, all those little baby seats strapped into them, uh, which was from the Obama Biden administration, right? Um, so knowing now that uh, and, and the Biden administration will sort of return in some way, um, you know, what are your thoughts about policy, policy change um, under um, Biden's presidency? So, I mean, he's, he's making a really, um, at least on the surface, really exciting appointment to, um, to Secretary of um, the Department of Homeland Security, which is great. Um, while you know, while it was he was still campaigning, and um, before the actual election, um, nobody really knew what his policies were. And I actually had to go. Somebody asked me, um, and I actually had to go to the Biden Harris kind of campaign website and look it up. And it all sounded really good. We're going to end family separation. We're not going to have children in cages. This is un American. Um, we're going to make a fairer immigration system. I don't really know what that looks like, but. Um, because I think what I would like to see is a little more radical than um, what I think he's willing to offer. But I think given the fact that his nomination, and I've, I've forgotten the name um, 
of of the person who's he's nominated Alejandro I think something uh, so shame on me um he was an immigrant he is an immigrant you know he has gone through the system so w one would hope that uh, on a human level uh, better things will happen but uh, the reality is again the US is built and many countries but since we're talking about the US, the US is built on um, on violence and on settler colonization, and it's not just going to end because his orangeness is not there. Okay, yeah, thanks. I mean, it was a sort of impossible question to answer. Yeah, really. that's fine. <laughs> Um, okay, you know, we have to uh, wrap up quite soon, but um, I'd like to just return to the literature and think, you know, I, lo I just love that phrase that you um, uttered in the second half of your talk, which was that the stories work in excess of conventional narrative strategies. Um, and, you know, it strikes me that um, the Lewis Selly book, you know, really um, employs a lot of documentary poetic techniques, uh, intertextual techniques, um, testimony, you know, and, and, and sort of uh, destabilizes the reader because we don't know what's real and what's not, you know, and who's lost and who's not, etc. Um, and what are echoes and what are real echoes, what are false memories, etc. Um, so I, I just, I would love to hear just a little bit more about how you um, see this fiction or this, this type of novel writing um, working to kind of decolonize the archive, um, kind of introduce counter kind of narratives, if you like. And um, if, if actually, if even if there are any other kind of examples that you would be you know, able to point us to, because, um, you know, reading mostly poetic texts myself, it was it was wonderful to encounter uh, these techniques being used in fictive form. Yeah, absolutely. I actually what I did was because I knew I'd forget. I made a list of other texts that, because I, I thought at least someone's going to say, what else can I read? Um, so I would recommend, um, but again, this is, this is a collection of poetry. And I think that's the challenge because what we have um, is this seemingly quite niche topic um, that needs to, needs to be treated using a range of, of forms, right? So, Javier Zamora's Unaccompanied, which I think I have here, um, really good text, a uh, great collection of poetry that I think everyone should read, just read it, it's great. Um, Zamora himself um, traveled to the US uh, from El Salvador um, as an unaccompanied child, so that is an actual testimony um, in an important way. Um, Gregory Nava's El Norte, which is a really, really great, 1983, so it's, um, I mean, it was it was made the year I was born, so I'm not going to say it's that old, but it's certainly uh, it's certainly not in the kind of period that I'm talking about today. But it's certainly something that um, captures the, the, what's going on. Pretty much, um, there are two or three texts by Luis Alberto Urrea, who um, some people might have read already, by the Lake of Sleeping Children and the Devil's Highway and the Water Museum um, are texts that people might want if you're interested in these kind of in, in, in what I'm calling children's crisis texts. Th these are some of the things that I'm looking at. Um, I forgot the first question. Oh, what are hybrid texts? Do, can you say it again? <laughs> no, I, I, I think I think you've sort of answered it because I'm just, you know, I'm just curious that the texts that seek to decolonize in all the ways that we've spoken about yeah. always end up being these kind of hybrid texts of, you know, of document, of, of record, of fiction, of, of, of testimony, of witness in different ways. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think there's a whole other conversation to have about that. Um, but I think you've answered that really, really beautifully for me. Um, and Una Forley says, it's been a fascinating talk from start to finish, reframing, distressing, reflective. Thank you. That's kind and sad. <laughs> Yes. Um, so, um, Zalfa, it remains for me to thank you again. I think this talk is going to stay with all of us for a very long time. I know it is with me. Um, 
Thanks again to Manis uh, English Department and to everyone who is joining us um, from the US or American, no matter where you are Zooming from, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> and um, yeah, have a lovely evening and stay safe. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.